seconds. Okay. Perfect. All right. So when it comes to weight loss, this is what we all expect, is that we're going to start doing something like a detox at the beginning of the year, and then instantly we're going to feel better and we're going to start losing weight. Everything's just going to change. What it really feels like most of the time, though, is that we've been doing this forever and nothing has changed, right? And in reality, this is more what it's actually like when it comes to weight loss. If you think about if you set a goal for yourself to lose 20 pounds, lose 50 pounds, um, and in a year from now, if your goal was to lose 25 pounds, would you be happy with yourself for losing 25 pounds in the course of a year? Most people would say yes, right? And the reality is if we give ourselves a year to lose 25 pounds, that's a half a pound a week, which is a couple of ounces every single day. So if we're tracking for long-term weight loss progress, do you think that getting on a scale every day is going to help track that progress? No, right? Uh, it's not going to be very beneficial to look at the scale every single day uh, because in reality, this is what happens. We wake up in the morning. We haven't eaten anything overnight. We haven't drank any water. We don't weigh very much. You get on the scale, you're happy with yourself. You go about the whole day, you drink a gallon of water, maybe two gallons of water, you eat a bunch of food, you get on the scale at the end of the day, and you're frustrated because you weigh more. And so we can't be using the scale as a good indicator. And if you want to be successful going through no sugar, or with any detox really, this is kind of the attitude that we need to change. I see there's children in the room, which I wasn't preparing for. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll skip that slide. <laughs> But you get the point. Uh, the scale is going to be the enemy in our situation. Uh, and so I know a lot of us may be started for this reason, and that's great. It's a great reason to do it. We just need to remember that getting on the scale is not going to be a helpful thing for our weight loss journey or for our health journey here with no sugar. So we're going to quickly skip past that. All right. So we're in day four of no sugar which means you guys probably don't feel amazing right now if you've already started. How many people don't feel great? If you're not raising your hand, you're a liar uh, or you're superhuman because I have felt terrible and this is my third time doing it. Uh, and so a lot of times what we'll notice at the beginning of the no sugar challenge for the first up to first week, first couple days or 10 days, a lot of weakness, a lot of headaches, trouble sleeping, tiredness, we don't feel great. Um, if you're into working out, workouts are going to start sucking. Sleep may not be great for the beginning of this challenge either. Um, we may get really bad headaches, migraines. We may be irritable. Our spouses may want to leave us or kick us out into the other room. Um, but it will get better. And by the end of the challenge, you're going to be feeling awesome. So just know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're going to have more energy, reduced joint pain, better skin, Weight loss will come, but you can see that's number four on the list. It's not the most important thing. Uh, brain fog, mental clarity, all that's going to get better. So speaking of brain fog and mental clarity, if the slides feel jumbled, it's because I waited till I started No Sugar to put the talk together so my brain wasn't fully working. Um, so in order to help you guys better understand what happens with your body during sugar, uh, I employed a helpful video here. So we're going to hope that this works and that the volume's turned on, which I know the volume's not turned on. Hey, show a little respect to little thing, okay? To you, I missed your stomach. <laughs> Whatever you say, Mr. Little Belly. Hey, boss, here's a sugar that says he wants to talk to you. Is it true? Yes, yes, let me talk to him. Are you sure, boss? There are already several of them today. You don't have to worry about it. Let me talk to him. Okay, boss, you are the boss. <laughs> hey, small intestine. Okay, here comes another sugar, and careful, because this one's a character. He's already here, man. Hey, to be a small intestine, you look pretty fat, buddy. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Look who's talking about fat, man. Okay, oh. raise your arms. Look at the dark spot. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, boss, here's another fool all the way. Oh, yeah. ah. Hey, finally. Come, come, let's get on with it. We don't have much time. Chop, chop. Uh -huh. Oh, we're looking forward to it. What will you want? More cortex or more frontal lobe, boss? Lobe, goat. Go for the lobe. Are you ready, boss? Here we go. Enjoy it. Don't believe me. me some happiness. Take me away from reality.
Zoinks, our time is up. That's it. Go. I, I have to keep working. What? But if I haven't finished, boss, where the heck do you want me to go? I don't know. To the liver, for example. <laughs> ah! <sighs> what? More sugar? Don't they see that it's so full of fat, for God's sake? Hey, pancreas, then. Release insulin, my man. I'm releasing to the limit, but it doesn't want to hear me. It seems to have some resistance. Ah, so nice. And so, we're sitting all day on the computer, aren't we? Ah, well, no way. To the storage. <laughs> oh, God. And now where the heck am I? Welcome to the abdominal fat deposit, my friend. Nobody watches here, and yet nobody takes us out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the reason we had to start off with a light-hearted video is because that's the simplest version of what happens when you eat sugar in your body. Uh, in order to kind of understand a little bit more of the importance of why we want to eliminate sugar and what's going to happen during this no sugar challenge, we're going to get a little bit deeper. But now that we have kind of a high-level understanding of Sugar comes into the body, it's absorbed in the small intestine, it immediately affects the brain, causes release of a happy neurotransmitter called dopamine, goes to the liver, the liver then stores it as fat if we don't use it, hence sugar causes us to be fat, basically. Um, so why does that happen? So basically this is kind of the overview of what happens when we eat sugar, uh, and sugar comes into the body. So it comes in through the intestines, blood glucose rises. So blood sugar rises. That blood sugar is going to have an effect on the brain. It's hopefully going to go to the muscles where we can use it for energy production. If it doesn't, it's going to go to the liver and then into fat or directly into fat tissue. Um, and so what kind of mediates what's going to happen with sugar when it comes into the body is a hormone called insulin. So insulin is what was being secreted by the pancreas, um, the guy playing with his hair there. Uh, and what happens is every time blood sugar increases, we're going to get that release of insulin. Insulin is going to basically unlock the cells to allow that blood sugar to come into the cell. So what that looks like is this is the membrane of all of our cells, um, and we have all of these little receptors within the cells. So, um, and as I go through this, I want you guys to ask questions. The entire slides, or the entire presentation is literally just pictures, and I'm going to talk. So if you guys have questions about something, if you want me to explain something further, just let me know. Um, I'm going to try to make it as simple and understandable as possible, though. So we have a hormone called insulin that's secreted by the pancreas when we intake sugar. Insulin goes into one of these binding sites on the cell membrane, binds, that's what this is right here, is insulin. Insulin binds to this receptor. This receptor then allows this transporter to open and glucose comes into the cells. So insulin, sugar, together into the cells. What insulin is, is it's an anabolic protein, or an anabolic hormone. Anabolic means that we're building things up. So insulin is going to drive energy into the cells. It's going to build our cells up. Um, so it can cause fat synthesis, protein synthesis, growth, and gene expression. The opposite of this hormone is what's called glucagon. So insulin and glucagon work kind of like a seesaw. Insulin is an anabolic hormone that builds things up. Glucagon, the opposite, is a catabolic hormone, which means it gets rid of things. So glucagon, if insulin brings glucose into the cells, causes increase in fat deposition, causes an increase in energy into the muscles, glucagon is going to do the opposite. It's going to bring sugar out of the cells, essentially. Um, so it's going to do a lot of cool stuff um, that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But again, I don't want to get super heavy into the biochemistry of all of this because, uh, frankly, it's not that important for what we're doing here. Um, but we have insulin and we have glucagon that kind of act as a little bit of a seesaw there. Uh, and so during exercise, what's going to happen is this is an ideal situation. So what will happen is we take sugar into the body, we release insulin. Insulin then binds with the sugar, brings the sugar into muscles. The muscles are then right away going to use that sugar in order to move, essentially. So we're going to turn that sugar into energy. The muscles are going to activate and do what they're supposed to do. Now, what happens is after we activate our muscles a whole bunch, the glucose or the sugar that was in the bloodstream, we used it all up, so the sugar is going to drop down. And at that point, we have two options to increase sugar in the bloodstream again. We can either eat another meal with sugar in it, 
or that's where glucagon can come into play where we start to pull that sugar out of fat storage, things like that. Um, so we may get low blood sugar after a workout because the muscles become more insulin sensitive so that they can restock muscle glycogen. Uh, and so this is kind of what this looks like. We have what's called a homeostatic balance where the body is always trying to maintain normal and it uses these two hormones, insulin and glucagon, in order to do that. So let's say we exercise. Exercise uses up, what's up guys? Is it just you? Okay, exercise uses up our blood sugar. So the pancreas is gonna secrete glucagon. Glucagon then tells the liver to turn something else into sugar to bring that blood supply back up. The opposite of that is let's say we eat a meal. The meal increases our blood sugar. The pancreas then secretes insulin. Insulin then drives that sugar into adipose tissue, into the liver, into muscle tissue. So let's say all of this happens the way it's supposed to and we want to not drive sugar into fat tissues. What will happen is every time we eat a meal with sugar, we produce insulin. Instead of driving it into the liver or into fat tissue, we're going to then take that right up into the muscles, utilize it, and that's how we're going to maintain that homeostatic balance. But how many people only eat sugar around a workout? Crickets. Everybody eats sugar all the time because we get sugar cravings, right? Even if you don't crave sweets like this, because I know a lot of people that don't crave sweets, don't eat a lot of candy, sugary foods, things like that, but still have a huge sugar problem. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Um, but this is what happens, right? And the reason for that is because sugar has a direct effect on the brain. So remember that little sugar molecule went up into the brain, he was giving the brain a massage, and then we had that cool little dopamine song. Well, sugar creates a dopamine response in the brain. Dopamine is gonna be an addictive hormone, so think other things that are gonna create a dopamine response are socializing, hanging out with friends, things like that, sex, drugs. So anything that's gonna create that addictive response, it does that for the most part through dopamine. So sugar is a very addictive chemical because of the way it responds hormonally within the brain. And so when we overactivate that reward center, aka I had sugar, I got that dopamine rush, I felt happy, I got a reward from that, and so I crave more sugar, and so then I get another dopamine rush, and we start overactivating that reward center, we're going to get cravings, we're going to lose control, and we're going to have an increased tolerance to sugar, which means it takes more sugar to create the same effect. And now we find ourselves eating more and more sugar. And when we don't have enough sugar, we don't activate that dopamine. And instead of feeling happy, we feel depressed. And so sugar can actually lead to depression in a lot of people. Um, and studies have shown that the more sugar consumption there is, the more likely you are to have depression. Um, so sugar has a lot of negative impacts on the body. Now, one of the reasons that foods create dopamine responses is actually uh, a primitive response to help us forage and find nutrients. Uh, and so if you think about an animal or a caveman foraging around through the jungle and they get food and they eat the food and the food gives them nourishment, that's why we eat from a primitive standpoint, it's going to create that dopamine response. But what happens in a normal circumstance with a normal healthy balanced diet is the more you eat a, a plate of food that's not full of sugar, the less that dopamine response is gonna happen. And so if you think about, you can go out to Outback, not Outback, go to a steakhouse, right? You go to Hyde Park and you get a great steak and it's awesome and you feel great. All you have is steak, asparagus, mashed potatoes, not a whole lot of sugar in that meal, but you feel awesome. And so you go back, you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, and gradually that same plate of food is gonna look less and less appetizing because the amount of dopamine that we're getting from that same meal is not as high. And what that's going to do is it's going to stimulate us to go look for a different type of food. From a primitive standpoint, the reason that we do that is because if we don't eat a balanced diet, we're not going to get a, an abundance of nutrients into the body. And so in order for us to be scavenging for different foods that are going to give us a different wide variety of nutrients, uh, the body decreases the amount of reward that we're getting. So we're encouraged to then go look for those foods. Sugary foods don't do that. Sugary foods are going to spike that dopamine response, so we're going to then create dysregulated dopamine levels in the brain, which can lead to depression when we don't have the sugary foods, and it leads to all those cravings. Um, and so this is why sugar is in everything. If you've, I'm sure you guys have noticed over the last four days that looking at ingredient labels, um, there's sugar in things that there's no business having sugar in them. And companies do that because... It's a billion dollar industry, the food industry, and if they can get you addicted to their food, they know that they're gonna have a customer for life. 
And so let's look at what happens when we succumb to the cravings and we start eating all of this sugar outside of the normal feedback loop and outside of exercise, right? So say we go back to this picture here and we had a big sugary meal and then we created the insulin response. Insulin drove that sugar into cells, but then we didn't exercise. So all that sugar just sat in the cells. And then we had another sugary meal. We increased insulin again and drove that sugar into cells again. Eventually what's going to happen is the cells are going to say, stop giving me sugar. I'm done. And you're going to get what's called insulin resistance. And this is one of the precursors for diabetes. We see this all the time when we look at blood work, where our insulin levels just start climbing up and climbing up and climbing up. Because what's happening over here is we're intaking sugar. The pancreas is going, all right, there's sugar, insulin, sugar, insulin, sugar, insulin. But the cells are saying, stop giving me insulin, and so they become resistant to it. They say, I don't want any more insulin, so it takes more insulin to have the same effect on the cells. And so if we do that over and over, we're going to start looking for other places to get, put that sugar, because your sugar is a neurotoxin. It will kill you if there's too much sugar in your bloodstream, so we have to get it out of the bloodstream. So if we can't go into muscles because we're not exercising and using it, where else can we go? And so that's where we start going to the liver. The liver starts converting sugar into fat, and it starts storing it. Now, Ideally, what would happen is if you were a bear or something like that, bears store a ton of fat and then they go hibernate and the bear's metabolism can drop by 80%. They can hibernate for very extended periods of time because their body is then accessing that, um, that fat storage to keep them going. And we'll talk about what that pathway looks like. But we're not bears and we don't hibernate. So now we ate all that sugar, we maxed out the muscles, we started creating insulin resistance, and now we started gaining weight. And what happens when we start gaining weight? Well, let's talk about, back that up. Okay, so we can't go into the muscle anymore, so we start going into adipose tissue. And fat, right, to the liver, the liver will then convert into fat, or we just go straight into fat there. So how much sugar does it take to do this? Well, the RDA for sugar, according to um, the Food and Drug Administration, the ADA, is... For men, 37.5 grams a day. For women, 25 grams a day. Uh, now, in my opinion, the RDA, which is the recommended daily allowance, so how much of this can you have in a day? Table sugar is a neurotoxin. You should have zero sugar in a day. There's literally no physiological need for you to have sugar in your diet. So we don't need sugar to run. This is already way too high. But if we look at where we're at, now, this graph only goes up to 2013, but I think it tells a pretty telling story. Back in the 1980s, average sugar consumption was over 85, right around 90. It spiked all the way up here at 110, and then around the year 2000 is when we started getting smart with it, and we started adding all of these sugar substitutes into things. And so the average sugar consumption came down, but it only came down to 95. That's still three times the upper limit for men, which is the highest limit. But look at what happened with the obesity trend. It didn't stop. So clearly obesity is not just related to sugar. There's got to be something else going on. And um, we're going to talk about what that means in a couple minutes. Uh, because sugar is very confusing, what it is. When they're looking at this graph, all they're looking at is refined sugars. And I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that. Um, so why do we need to make a change to this? Well, it doesn't just affect us. It doesn't just affect people who are dealing with these things. Really, it affects everybody. Uh, the personal cost of obesity, it adds, on average, in the U.S., $7,337 to your medical bills every single year. So if you're dealing with obesity because of sugar consumption, which you have direct control over, that's a huge hit on your wallet. Um, I can't blow this all up. Um, but if we look at what that looks like on a higher scale in the US, the estimated annual medical cost of obesity is $147 billion with a B. Uh, those who are, medical, or who are obese, their medical costs average about $1,429 more than someone who's normal weight. Obese adults spend 42% of on direct health care costs, 42% more. Um, and healthcare costs for severely morbidly obese adults are 81% higher than healthy adults. 
And if you look at what this looks like on a global scale, obesity costs us about $2 trillion a year globally. So we talk about the debt that we're in in the country, the economy, things like that. Obesity is a huge, huge toll and tax on the economy. Now, who benefits from this? $2 trillion. Who's getting that $2 trillion? The healthcare people, right? Hospitals, the people that you're paying to put you on medications, the pharmaceutical companies. Do you think that they have your best interest in mind when you're the reason that there's a $2 trillion market cap for obesity? So we've got to think differently about this if we want to start making changes. We can't trust the people who are in charge because everything is profit-driven. Um, and quite frankly, what they're telling you doesn't make sense. So one of the big reasons for this is because of what we're being told by my plate, by the food pyramid, things like that. Everybody's told you need to eat carbs. Carbs are good. Fat's the bad guy. Fat makes you fat. Carbs are good. In reality, that's not true at all. Uh, and carbs and sugar are what make you fat. Eating fat doesn't actually make you fat. Yet, the USDA healthy diet recommendations are 65% carbs, 18% protein, and 19% fat. If you go to the ADA diet, it's a little bit better. 60% carbs, a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat. But let's step back for a minute and think about what food and nutrition is. All we're trying to do when we eat from a physiological standpoint is we're trying to give our body resources that it can use to produce energy, to grow, to develop, to function, right? We're not trying to just eat things because they taste good. We should be eating things that are going to nourish our body. Well, if we look at what's in the brain, the brain's about 61% fat, 35% protein, and only 4% carbohydrates. If we look at the body, 35% fat, 45% protein, 5% carbs, 15% everything else. So if this is what the brain looks like, and this is what the body looks like, does this really make sense for what our diet should look like? No, right? That doesn't make any sense. So is it really any surprise that 4 in 10 people in the U.S. have at least one chronic disease right now? No, 6 in 10 people in the U.S. have a chronic disease. So clearly something has to change. Uh, and so this is typically the ratios that we'll recommend to people in the office, 55% fat, 35% protein, and 10% carbs. Now, how many people could go out to the grocery store, start making meals, and start doing this right away? No. So how do we make the transition to that? And that's kind of where the no sugar challenge comes in. So we're going to force you to do it to an extreme degree for 30 days, and we're going to all do it together so we can all be in it as a community and we can rely on each other, right? So the Wellness Week created the No Sugar Challenge to jumpstart getting us on the right track with eating and cleaning up our health. Uh, and so to understand what the No Sugar Challenge is, we really have to understand what sugar is. A quick Google search pulls up Wikipedia. So sugar is a generic name for sweet-tasting, soluble carbohydrates, many of which are used in food. Simple sugars, also called monosaccharides, include glucose, fructose, and galactose. So, again, sugar is a generic term. And I want you guys to remember this word, monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose. In a couple slides, we're going to talk about that. Uh, and so, when we look again at this obesity epidemic, they're calling sugar, they're referring to refined carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, uh, like the three that we just mentioned. And so, we can cut those out but if we go back and look at what we were talking about this whole time, let's see here. Were we talking about sugar anywhere on here? No, we were talking about this guy right here, glucose. So when we talk about sugar, it's a generic term for a bunch of different things that we get from our diet. It's not a specific term for what happens on a physiological standpoint. And so when we do no sugar January, what we're trying to accomplish are specific physiological responses within the body. And so because of that, we have to be very restrictive. Reason for that is sugar is not just one thing. So when they're talking about sugar, they're talking about this group right here, glucose, fructose, galactose. Now, when we talk about things like table, su table sugar, anybody know what table sugar is? Table sugar is sucrose. 
So sucrose, these disaccharides, basically what that means is that we have two sugars put together. So we've got this group of disaccharides over here. We've got maltose, which is basically two glucose molecules bound together. We've got sucrose, which is a glucose bound with a fructose. And we've got lactose, which is a glucose bound with a galactose. So if we're looking at the body and everything we just talked about from a physiological standpoint referring to glucose, then not only do these affect glucose, all of this affects glucose as well. Well, how about carbs? How about things that are good for us like beans, starches, fibers, things like that? Well, when we break those down into all of their components, really all those are is chains of glucose molecules. So instead of being a simple carbohydrate that's just one sugar molecule or two sugar molecules, these complex carbohydrates are a bunch of sugar molecules all bound together. And anybody want to guess what happens to that when it gets into your body? It gets broken down to glucose. So then from a physiological standpoint, is a complex carbohydrate that you get from eating a black bean any better for you than just straight table sugar? Physiologically, when it gets into your body. No, it's not. Um, and so the only thing that's not going to get absorbed like that is cellulose, which is fiber. And you can see the different bonds that we have on the fiber molecule that don't get broken down. They stay in your gut. So this is going to be a big distinction when we start talking about things like vegetables, which are very high in carbohydrates, but you're still allowed to have on the diet because the glucose and the sugar that's in vegetables is mostly fiber, which means it's not going to get into your body and affect your blood sugar. All of these other starches are going to cross into your body and affect your blood sugar, affect your glucose levels. Um, and so a really a cool distinction that I heard on a podcast a couple weeks ago talked about the difference between a food scientist, a nutritionist, and then a metabolic physiologist and the distinctions that come of that. So you're going to have a lot of people that tell you these are fine for you. They're okay. It's not the same in your body. So a food scientist person is going to specialize in, in the understanding of what happens from food from the time it leaves the ground to the time it gets into your mouth. A nutritionist is going to focus on what happens from the time the food enters your mouth to the time it gets into the cell. And a metabolic physiologist or someone like what we do in our office, we're focusing on what happens to that when it gets inside your cell. And so they're going to tell you this stuff is very similar, or it's all different, right? But when it gets into the cell, it's the same. And so that's why the no sugar list gets so large, basically. That's why you can't have natural sugar. That's why you can't have fruits, things like that. Because when it gets into your cell, it's no different than anything else. And so when we look at trying to figure out what sugar is, it's over 216 names for sugar. How many people looked at that list of sugar stuff or on the no sugar list and didn't realize that some of that stuff was sugar? I did the first time I looked at it. I didn't know all this stuff. I know it now because I've been doing it for a long time, but imagine how confusing it can get reading ingredient labels. You look at ingredient labels for things like Nature Valley bars that are advertised to be healthy, like seven to 10 different types of sugar in a single candy bar or a single nutrition bar, whatever it is. Um, so start looking at labels on things you've got laying around your house and just start trying to count how many different ways they told you there's sugar in there without telling you there's sugar in there. So it gets very confusing. So when we look at the no sugar challenge, foods to avoid. Top left is my favorite one. That's the one I get the most questions on. Well, why can't I have fruit? Fruit is good for me. No one's saying fruit's not good for you. There's a lot of really good things that come in fruit. But what we're trying to do is allow your body to restore itself from a physiological standpoint. If we're trying to do that, we can't still be giving it glucose if we're trying to undo the damage that glucose has caused. So fruit is a lot of sucrose. It's a lot of... Um, fructose, and it's a lot of glucose. So we're going to be getting a ton of that stuff from a physiological standpoint, same effect. Same thing with our starchy vegetables. I thought acorn squash, butternut squash, beets are so good for me. There's so many good things in beets. There are a lot of good things in beets, but beets are starchy root vegetables. There's a lot of sugar in them, so they're off the list. Um, so the reason that I wanted to go through all that boring stuff at the beginning was so that we can understand a little bit more of the why behind this list. Because 
when we put this list together, it was designed to have a physiological effect on the body. And so in order to do that, we have to break all the food components down into how they're going to respond physiologically in the body. Um, does everybody have this? Yeah, okay, so we're going to make sure you guys all leave with this stuff. Um, what is it with the pistachios? Pistachios are actually very high in sucrose. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, foods to enjoy. You guys should all be familiar with this if you've started it. Um, this is kind of where I want to open it a little bit more to questions. Um, does, do people have questions about this list? Yes. So I saw it's half a cup of nuts, right? So like specifically, I know pistachios are off, but let's say I'm snacking on cashews. Yeah. Why? I guess, I mean, you don't need to eat that many nuts for this to work. I mean, what, what, what's the reason for half a cup instead of like that I could have? I mean, it's a lot of nuts. So almost everything... There's nothing that's exclusively, well, okay, so there are some things that are exclusively fat, but they're refined, like coconut oil is pretty much exclusively fat. Now, otherwise, nothing is exclusively one thing. You have combinations of everything. And so what we're looking at is what's it going to take to create a, the physiological response in the body. So if you sit down and you eat an entire bag of cashews, well, then the total amount of sugar that you're consuming is equivalent to something else, basically. So it's how much of that is it going to take to create a physiological response. If it's a banana, I go eat a banana, my blood sugar is going to spike in 15 minutes. So um, it takes less that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have questions about these lists? So now's your time. No? Everybody's perfect? But Yes. Your guys' list might have been the 2023 list. If you got it from the email I sent you, the lists are the same. The formatting is different. Okay. So if you guys want the updated list, this is the bottom half of this page. This is a separate page. Um, they just made it. They put it in their groups as opposed to listing specific foods because everybody started asking, well, can I have this food and this food and this food? And the list cannot possibly be all-encompassing. So by putting it into in the groups, it more broadly encompasses things. Um, but there's not a whole lot of things that change there. All right, so let's talk about why we may have some of the negative symptoms. Um, this is something I wanted to talk about, didn't know where to put it, so I put it right here. Um, how many people said that they experienced some of this, these issues? Yeah. Um, so one of the big ones is weakness, tiredness, difficulty sleeping, things like that. Um, I know I personally experienced this. I'm training right now for a marathon in three weeks. This was terrible timing for me to be doing a no sugar challenge. Um, but I've noticed significant decreases in my strength and endurance running doing no sugar. And the reason for that is explained overly simplified by this um, drawing right here. So these dark arrows right here are sugar. These arrows over here are fat. So basically what's going to happen is when we convert or when we get all the glucose out of our diet, we're going to have to start utilizing fat for energy. And so we can use fat directly through the diet, but the liver can also convert fat storage into fat and into glucose. So as long as we have some fat on our body, which everybody has some fat on their body, we're going to be able to utilize that to convert fat into sugar or glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis, which is building new glucose molecules from something else. But it doesn't happen as fast as just, as fast as just straight up eating glucose or sugar in your diet. And so what happens is not every organ system can run directly on fat, which is what we're going to be getting a lot more of in our diet. So the brain can't and the red blood cells can't. And so what that means is that any sugar that we have is going to be prioritized to these, and we're going to kind of shut down sugar consumption to that. And so we talked about insulin resistance and what happens if we eat a bunch of sugar but then we don't utilize the sugar and we get that insulin resistance because the cells are full. That's what's called pathological insulin resistance. We have this really cool thing called physiological insulin resistance. And the only reason I'm talking about it is because I think it's kind of cool um, from a fasting, keto, athletic type of a standpoint. But basically what's going to happen is when we starve our body of glucose, your body is really smart. It's always trying to protect itself. And so it's going to shut down insulin sensitivity in certain areas of the body, like the muscles, so that it can prioritize all that glucose into other areas. And we can use fat. The problem with that 
is we don't typically get enough fat. And because we have glucose present in such high amounts all the time, the body never actually has to use fat for energy. And it's mostly focused on storing fat. And so it takes time for us to be able to activate those energy pathways to start utilizing that fat. And that's why we feel awesome when we get to the end of no sugar and we feel really terrible at the beginning of no sugar is because we're trying to switch energy systems and we're prioritizing certain things over other things. So what you'll notice is towards the end of no sugar, you're going to start feeling awesome. Um, last year I did no sugar. I did a half marathon a couple days afterwards and I set a PR and I felt amazing because I was able to get into those different energy systems. But right now it sucks because my body's still trying to figure it out. Um, so not that important, just a cool little tidbit there. So what can we do in the first couple weeks to help with some of those bad side effects? Drink lots of water. I'm drinking lots of water. You guys need to drink lots of water as well. One of the big reasons for that is that as our body starts activating fat storage for energy, it's going to start releasing a lot of toxins. Like I said, your body's really smart. And a lot of times what will happen is when there's toxins circulating in the body that are damaging, if your body can't get rid of them, it's going to store them away in places like fat to protect itself. And so a lot of times people are going to struggle losing weight because they're going to have, or because they can't get rid of the toxins and stuff that are in the weight there or in the fat tissue. And so that kind of gets back into the headaches, why we have headaches. Well, when you start releasing a lot of that fat, you're going to free up those stored toxins and they can irritate different tissues. They can create headaches, things like that. So drinking plenty of water is going to help make sure that you're flushing all of that out. You're also going to notice more fatigue uh, because our body's not able to gain as much energy from glucose. And so one of the big things is really just protecting your sleep, making sure that you're setting up good bedtime routines, you're taking naps on weekends when you can, you're sleeping well. Um, light energy, so light energy is going to actually activate more production of glucose. So if your glucose is really low, a little bit of light exercise will start to stimulate some of your stress hormones that will tell the body to produce more glucose. So it's not as, as long as you're not doing so much exercise that you're going to burn through all the glucose you produce, you can elevate your blood sugar a little bit by doing that. And then just staying mentally tough. That's why we wanted to get everybody together in a room or online because we want to be here to help support you. And hard things are easier when you're going through it together. Uh, okay. Uh, this is just a description of gluconeogenesis. Basically what happens is we take triglycerides, which are stored in adipose tissue, so basically fat cells, and we can run them backwards through the liver to produce glucose, which can then go into muscles and things like that. The gluconeogenesis pathway doesn't get used a whole lot unless you're doing things like intermittent fasting, like 24-hour, 36-hour fasting. Uh, and so when you go into this very, very low glucose consumption or no sugar state, it's very similar to a fasted state. And so you're going to start activating this pathway again. This is why you're going to lose weight when you start doing the no sugar challenge. So what can we do to help support this? Well, like I said, the body is all pathways. It takes nutrients to run pathways. And so when we give you supplementation, supplements are literally just giving your body the nutrition and the nutrients it needs to run a pathway. Um, and if we've been running pathways, the same pathways all the time, it's kind of like driving your car 100 miles an hour. It needs gas. And it's fine if the tank's full of gas, but if we're consistently pedal to the metal all day long, we're going to run out of gas. And so what we're doing with no sugar is we're taking the foot off the gas and what these supplements are going to do is help to fill the tank back up. So when we go back to normal eating or a modified version of what your diet was like before, we can actually run those pathways and be successful. Um, so blood sugar glandular is just ground up uh, liver, kidney, pancreas, uh, and I believe small intestines. So by eating glandulars like that, you're just feeding your body all the nutrients it needs to heal those tissues. And since most people nowadays aren't eating organ meats, we have them in capsule forms. If you look at back to primitive animal life, if you see a, a lion kill a gazelle out on the plains, what's the first thing the lion goes for? Is it the skeletal muscle, the legs, or are they digging into the gut and eating all the organs? But we've gotten so far away from primitive in instincts and primitive eating that that's why we have supplements now. Because again, supplements are meant to Fill pathways are supplementing things you can't get in your diet. And so if you're choosing not to get it in your diet, then you can take a supplement and you're going to help support those pathways. California poppy is going to help to pull the stress response down. Um, 
I've got a whole another talk that I did last year uh, that talks all about what we need to do to lose weight. Um, so I'm, I'm going to probably record that talk this month. I can send it to you guys if you're interested in that. Um, but stress is a huge thing that blocks us from being able to lose weight. So California poppy helps to pull that stress response down. Uh, Oregon grape and gymnema are going to help to level out your blood sugar, and schisandra helps to clear things out and support liver function. Um, so all of these together are a really great support systems. so they're on sale for 15% off um, for the duration of January. So if you guys want extra support, those are really great options for you. So yeah, how else can we be successful? Plan out meals, prepare things ahead of time. Um, so I spent a bunch of time over the weekend getting lunches prepared, things like that, because if you can make it easy, you're going to make yourself successful. And so dedicating time to being able to meal prep and plan ahead is going to help you make it successful. Give yourself plenty of rest and hydration. Um, utilize the Lakewood, Health, Lakewood Ranch Holistic Health Group. Is everybody in that group on Facebook? Okay. Yeah. So if you're not in that Facebook group, it's called Lakewood Ranch Holistic Health. This talk is streaming live in that group right now. It'll be saved there. So if you want to go back and rewatch it, you can. If you want to send it to friends, you can also do that. Um, and then we're going to now just take the remainder of the time here to go through some resources to help get you guys set up to be successful. Um, so this is our health coach, April. She's going to come up and help walk through some of this. She is also here to be a resource, so you can set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with her uh, if you're struggling and need extra support, and she is also available for text and email support. So, Are you going to hand these to us, or will we need to write copy this? I believe we're going to have QR codes on papers. Yeah, we'll have the links for you guys. Um, so these are things that we all use personally. Um, so I'm going to just start pulling some of this stuff up on the Internet. And we're going to walk through it together. Hello. And I believe I have to shut my PowerPoint down. Let's see here. Hello. Does anybody have other questions while I'm trying to get this going here? Okay. No? I just have a quick question. What if yeah. someone's already thin? Not me. <laughs> if someone was really thin and they started eating this way, what would happen? So... Uh, I don't know if I put that graphic in here. Okay, here we go. Let's, let me pull this graphic up. This is kind of the graphic that I skipped here. Um, so this, your body needs glucose for energy. It's just a matter of how is it going to get the glucose? Are you directly giving yourself glucose or are you giving yourself other things that be, can be converted into glucose or used for energy instead? So we can use fat storage if you don't have a lot of fat storage, you still have some, but this is probably not going to be your main pathway. So if you're not eating anything and you're just in a complete fasted state, no nutrition going into your body, then your body is going to start breaking down muscle tissue into different amino acids, and then you're going to start using those amino acids to convert into glucose. We're not in a completely fasted state. We're giving our body nutrients, we're giving our body fat, and we're giving our body protein. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, the longest, anybody know what the longest fast on record is? No? Uh, I'm, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure it's around 400 days. Big guy, basically hibernating. But he burnt Hello. through all of his fat storages. And then after 400 days, he felt the urge to eat, and he ate. So... That's what's going to happen is um, if you're doing a fast, again, we'll talk about this at another point, um, but yeah, anyway, so you're not going to kill yourself doing no sugar because you're giving your body the resources it needs, um, but yeah, okay, so Force of Nature is my all-time favorite online shop for really high-quality produce, or not produce, sorry, really high-quality proteins. Um, so we talked about the benefits of eating organ meats because it's going to give your body a ton of nutrients. The body stores uh, a lot of nutrients in organs. So if we want to heal the organs, the best thing that we can do is eat them and feed ourselves those nutrients. Um, so my favorite thing about this Force of Nature website is that they have organ meats that are conveniently ground up inside of ground meat. Um, so they have these ancestral blends. They have beef, 
bison, uh, and venison ground up with the organ meat in it. So when you're meal prepping, I make burgers, I make meatballs, I make all sorts of stuff. And this is what I use instead of using traditional ground beef. Uh, they used to actually have chicken on here. It's not on here anymore. Um, but I see a lot of like faces that are grossed out. But you don't taste the organs when they're ground up like this, which makes it easier and more accessible to build a healthy habit. Dr. Allison doesn't like it either. Uh, okay, so let's talk about no sugar things to make no sugar easy. Um, having things in the freezer on hand is super important. So when you get home after a long day, like when I get home at 8 o'clock tonight and don't have anything waiting for me at home, I have a ton of these things saved in my freezer. So the wild boar sausages right here are awesome. And unlike a lot of other... Um, like if you go to the store, sausage is almost always going to have sugar in it, or it's going to have fruit or something in there to sweeten it up. So this wild boar sausage right here is literally just wild boar, grass-fed beef, salt, black pepper, garlic powder, smoked paprika, onion powder, celery powder, mustard powder, and thyme. So unless you have an allergy to one of these things, it's totally fine for no sugar. These you can just keep a bunch of them in your freezer, pull them out, thaw them, throw them on the grill, cook them up. And that makes a really great and simple meal. Breakfasts, people get really hung up on breakfast as well um, because a lot of people are eating oatmeal or carbs, cereal, things like that for breakfast, uh, or you're doing yogurt, that type of stuff. Uh, my favorite thing that I've been doing every single morning for breakfast is, I think it was back here. All right, so the breakfast sausage on here does not have any sugar in it. It's sold out, but what I did the first day was this chorizo. So what I do with that is I just cook up a bunch of it, throw it in the refrigerator, and then I just pull it out in the morning and heat it up in the pan. And this morning I did that with sun-dried tomatoes and artichokes, and it was awesome. So there's ways that you can get really nutritious, healthy meals in, um, and that's why sites like this are awesome. They've got a bunch of steaks, venison, elk, all sorts of stuff on here as well. Um, so as you can see, beef, bison, elk, pork, wild boar, venison, and chicken. So there's a ton of different animal cuts that you can't get in the regular store on here as well. Uh, and that goes back to the variety. We're going to get slightly different nutrients from all those different animals. So if you can mix up the type of meat that you're eating, you're going to help get different nutrients. The other one on here was, let's see here, Thrive Market. How many people have heard of Thrive Market? All right, cool. So uh, I'll still go through it if I can open this link up. Okay. Uh, don't look at my non no sugar purchases <laughs> up here. Hide those. Uh, <laughs> um, but you can search up here. So, Force of Nature has a lot of your meat. This has all of your, basically all your dry goods and stuff on there. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through this, but this is basically like an online grocery store. Um, and the cool thing is that you can go in here and you can filter out certain things. You can go gluten-free, you can go sugar-free, you can go all of those things. Um, and so like Whole30 is pretty compatible for the most part with no sugar. There's going to be some things you can't have, um, but it has tons of stuff on here. Plus, I'm sure you guys have noticed that if you guys are cooking weird recipes, it's going to call for weird ingredients that you haven't heard of before. So a lot of times you can find those ingredients on Thrive Market. Next one is... Last couple are going to be just helpful resources to actually find recipes. Um, and then April's going to come up and we're going to talk about how to work through recipes to make them no sugar. Because most recipes aren't just going to be no sugar off the bat. How many people are familiar with Pinterest? Okay. One from every household at least. So that's good. Uh, this is my Pinterest. You can search, I guess, Dr. Connor Wolf on Pinterest. I've got a bunch of different stuff. Ignore everything that's not in this no sugar category. So 
I'm going to keep updating and adding stuff to this. This is mostly the stuff that I made last year during No Sugar, but I'm going to keep adding new stuff as I find it. Um, not everything is immediately No Sugar compatible, but it's very easy to make swaps. Um, so this Thai coconut lime chicken is what I was supposed to make for dinner tonight. I'm probably not going to do this tonight because it's going to take too much time. Um, but this is, another, this is one that's not directly compatible with No Sugar, uh, but we'll talk about how you can quickly make it No Sugar compatible. Um, so, actually, this one is directly compatible with No Sugar. Um, so this would be a great one that you can just make. This is also an Instant Pot recipe, I believe. So you can go home and just throw it in the Instant Pot. You can do it before you leave for work and set it on a delay, and then you have your food ready for you when you get home. Uh, how about those sweet cravings that don't just go away overnight? Anybody struggling with sweet cravings? With sweet cravings? I made vegan ice cream probably 10 separate times last No Sugar. Uh, if you guys get an ice cream maker, this is awesome. This is There's 20 recipes on here. You're going to have to find the one that's correct. Um, we'll get you guys the link for the actual, the one that I was making. It's super easy though. It's just a can of organic coconut cream. Then I, I dump the can of coconut cream into a mixing bowl. I fill the can back up with regular coconut milk or nut milk or something. And then you add a teaspoon of arrowroot flour, flour or I think it's a teaspoon, to, uh, to thicken it up. And then a quarter cup of monk fruit sweetener. And then vanilla, chocolate chips, chocolate, cinnamon, mint extract, whatever you want to add in there. Um, so it's like five ingredients. It's super easy. Uh, and it tastes awesome. Um, OK. The Wellness Way website also has a ton of recipes on it. So if you go to the Wellness Way, I could type. Did I spell that right? I did not spell that right. All right, if you go to the Wellness Way, go to Resources, click on Recipes. You can filter out your recipes down here, all the way over to No Sugar. All of these No Sugar recipes here are going to be directly compatible with the No Sugar diet with no changes. Um, these are all Christy Flynn's recipes, and they are awesome. Pizza crust, look at that. You can still have pizza on No Sugar. Uh, I'm going to have pizza on Friday, and I'm very excited for it. Uh, okay, and then the last one that I wanted to go over is going to be with April, if you want to come up here, because this is one of April's resources that we'll make sure you guys get access to. Where is it? Does anybody need a stretch or anything? I know you've been sitting for a little while. <laughs> this is the time to do it. April looking out for you guys. Look yeah. at that. All right. All right. So you can move about if you want. Um, I do want this to be interactive. And if you have questions, just holler at me. Um, but I just put together 42 different recipes. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too overwhelming. Um, but again, Make sure when you're looking at these recipes that you're sticking to your food allergies or any kind of sensitivities. And if you see something on there, I'm, I tried my best to make sure there weren't any ingredients that were on the avoid list. But if there is, just swap it out with another vegetable. Um, or if you're just not a big um, beef lover and you want to switch it out for something else, you can do that too. Um, especially if you already have food on hand. But really, these are just to give you an inspiration, a guide to follow. They're really all clean ingredients, usually 10 ingredients or less, um, usually 30 minutes. I mean, there's a slow cooker one that's two hours and 15 minutes, but the slow cooker is doing the actual cooking. But um, can I just scroll down here? Yeah. So do people have questions about specific things that you've had come up that you've struggled with or that you want to know how to make something compatible? Greg? How can I find no sugar chocolate chips? If you go, I can't find them in the store. Every if, time I go, there's sugar. 
I bought three bags of them from Whole Foods today. So if you we went after I was there, you may not have had any. <laughs> Uh, so if we go back to, they're on Thrive Market. I'll show you what they are right now. Is it Lily's? It's Lily's brand. Yeah. Uh, the dark chocolate. Yes. So not all of the Lily, Lily's brand chocolate is compatible because a lot of it has soy in it. So read the ingredient labels always. <laughs> These are the compatible chocolate chips. Yes. Um, for the lilies, it's just like the white chocolate is supposed to be more milk, and the milk chocolate that's supposed to be other stuff. Yeah, this, so the orange package, the dark chocolate, is the one that you're allowed to have. And I'd be lying if I said I don't eat handfuls of them at a time. They are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, good question, Greg. And you can get those at Whole Foods. I believe you can even get those at Publix. I got it at Publix. Yeah. 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 They used to sell them at Costco. That's how you that that. would have been dangerous. I know, big bad. Yeah. Any other questions about stuff, specifics? What's everybody made that they've enjoyed so far? What? Cod. Cod. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Judy. I should probably look at them again. There's frozen sausages at Costco. Are they under the no sugar? Yes, they okay. are. Yes. The Jones. Jones? Jones Farms, that Costco, they have a big chicken sausage yeah, bag, yeah, and there's no sugar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Costco also has the giant things of wild brine, mm -hmm. sauerkraut. Actually, they didn't have it the last time I was there. I was annoyed. Um, you can get the wild brine at, or the Bubba sauerkraut at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And then they also have Grillo pickles. What kind of pickles? They're, Grillo is the brand. They're just dill pickles. I had three of them after I saw patients this morning because I was like shaking and needed <laughs> salt and something to eat. So I ate three pickles and a half a bag of green beans. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you're, you're going to be eating foods that you're just like, yeah. this isn't usually a meal or a snack, but it's going to give you the nutrients So you need. Whole Foods is also awesome. I'm going to show you this. So like snacks are kind of tough. This is awesome, this Ithaca hummus. I just got three containers of this today also. Um, so if you like dipping, like if you... Because a lot of it's about textural stuff. A lot of people crave potato chips. They crave corn chips, things like that. And it's not necessarily that you're craving the chip, but you want something crunchy, something salty. So like this, the hummus is awesome. It's got, if you dip something crunchy, like a raw vegetable, a green bean, something like that, you're going to get that crunchy satisfaction. Uh, if you eat pickles, you're going to get really salty stuff. That's why I like the artichokes in my breakfast because it's super salty. The chorizo has a ton of flavor in it. Um, so one of the biggest things I find that people struggle with is that they don't season enough. Mm -hmm. If you're relying on other things like carbs and sugar to bring the satisfaction from the meal, you're not going to have to season as much. So double, triple the amount of seasoning, the amount of salt that you're putting on things is going to be one way to make, it super to make yourself satiated. And then adding in fats as well. Making hummus at home is actually really easy. As long as you have like a food processor, it's like maybe three ingredients. Yeah. And then you can flavor it as you wish, like with everything bagel seasoning. Yeah. So, it's really good. Um, I do want to pass these out. So if you're looking to work with me or need extra guidance or accountability, I have some information in case you are curious or want to join. Um, but I do text and email like a concierge service. So, um, are you guys together? Okay. Um, and then one on one sessions, or I can go to the grocery store with you. Um, yeah. Coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and so learning new cooking techniques, play around with different things, play around with different spices you're not used to cooking with. Um, be careful with any pre-mixed spices that you have in the refrigerator, in your pantry at home. A lot of times they'll throw sugar in there, they'll throw MSG in there. If it says spices, spices could literally mean anything. It could mean sugar, it could mean MSG. Uh, and so if your seasoning mix says spices on it, it's not going to be good for no sugar. 
unless you call the company directly and ask, does it have this, 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 or this in it? <laughs> um, but I do like blackened seasoning all the time. We did blackened um, black salmon the other night with green beans, almonds, and then I cooked the green beans with a ton of salt, garlic, and lemon juice. So I got acidity, I got saltiness in there, we got the crunchiness, uh, we got the spice from the blackened. So sugar is just one of our receptors on our tongue. If you're adding in a variety of other types of flavors, I guess, you're going to also help to satiate yourself. So play around with sour, play around with spice, with salt, with umami, those types of things. Um, and you'll find that you're not, you're kind of cutting some of those cravings out. And over time, your taste buds will actually adjust and you won't want those sugary yeah. treats anymore. <laughs> yeah, by the end of the 30 days, it's not going to be an issue because you're going to start to lose your cravings and mm -hmm. you're not going to feel like you need to fill your plate with carbs. It's very difficult in the beginning. Um, Anybody have any other questions about anything we talked about today? Is there, is, I imagine, somebody said beef sticks that they were eating this, but those are processed, aren't they? Like, uh, if you get, so if you get, on the brand. yeah, the Chomps ones are good. I make beef jerky at home in the Traeger sometimes, um, so you can control what's in it, but a lot of times beef jerky is going to have a ton of sugar in it because they're going to cure the meat with sugar. Mm -hmm. um, today buy one get one free these things mm. they're chicken they're, but they have one gram of sugar yeah so don't look at the nutrition facts that say one gram of sugar 10 grams of carbs five grams it's of protein sugar down the ingredients that's where it's the x is right yes you want to look at the ingredients label the nutrition facts label means literally nothing to it should mean nothing to anybody it's about what's in the food that's important um costco right now has 12 packs of the red and green chomps, which I think is the original, and the jalapeno. And having, there you go. Pete's got <laughs> one in the back. So that, and then if you can get a protein and a fat in the afternoon, like a chomp stick, a scoop of coconut oil, it sounds nasty, but you're gonna just give your body a ton of energy and nutrition. Um, so if you're feeling like you're crashing and stuff in the afternoon, where you would normally go and grab a Snickers bar or some sort of snack, um, adding a protein and a fat, is a great way to kind of curb that hunger issue. Half an avocado with everything but the bagel seasoning. Cool. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any avocados this entire week. I just got a bunch today. And you get those at Costco, don't you? Yeah, the problem with Costco's avocados is they're never ripe, so you have to prepare like a week ahead of time. Public says them for a dollar each. Do they? Today, yeah. You can get mine at all these are 59 cents an avocado. Oh. Okay. So I did Whole Foods pickup on Amazon today because I don't have time and we've got, I won't be home till 8 o'clock tonight. So also utilizing resources like that is a great way to be able to get the groceries and stuff you need. You can order them ahead of time and all you have to do is pick up. Um, so finding ways to make it easy to save yourself time is really going to be the most important thing. Cool. And then what we're going to plan to do is the last week of January, we'll send out another email. We're probably going to do a talk on how to transition off of no sugar, how to start reintroducing some of these foods. Um, so what we don't want to do is go and eat everything you've been craving for the last 30 days and go have a huge meal from Olive Garden or something, right? Um, that would just kind of throw away everything you just did. So we want to start slowly reintroducing foods, working on maintaining some of the habits. Um, so we'll send out another email on the specific date of that talk. Um, but that will probably be a shorter talk, and we'll just go through kind of some of the steps, things that you can continue doing to maintain the progress that you made. All right? Did I see liverwurst on there? But that was probably, yeah. yeah. Did you eat it? I no. looked at some of the grocery store today, and it had sugar in it. Mm -hmm. Where'd you find liverwurst at? There are websites that you can buy liverwurst online. A lot of your organ meats you've got to get online. Yeah. Publix has some kind of liverwurst. Yeah. One, one brand. I'm shocked. Okay. I'm actually really shocked by that as well. Um, try new things. Whole Foods a lot of times has bone marrow. That's an awesome way to, to curb your appetite as well. All you have to do is throw it in the oven with some salt on top of it, and it is delicious. Bone marrow is awesome, and you're getting a ton of nutrition from it. I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> cool. My dogs love it. <laughs> yes, the dogs love it because dogs are smart. Yeah. All right. Oh, 
Everybody got a sheet with all of these links and stuff? Everybody feels like they're ready to be successful? Cool? All right, class dismissed. Thank you all. Thank you guys for coming and spending your evening with us. We're excited. The next talk, we'll all be talking about how good we